Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Parkinson's disease. It's a progressive disorder of the nervous system that affects mainly movement. It develops gradually, sometimes starting with a barely noticeable tremor of one hand. And we all probably know someone who has or had Parkinson's disease. And it's really, it's difficult to watch when it happens. And in fact, one of my mentors, one of my very good friends, died of Parkinson's disease at a relatively young age. And it was difficult for all of us to watch. While there's no cure, treatment can help effectively manage the symptoms. And April is Parkinson's Awareness Month. So here to discuss Parkinson's disease is Mayo Clinic neurologist, Dr. Eric Alskog. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Alskog. Good to see you. Hello, Tracy and Tom. How are you? Oh, it's so good to see you, especially at this time of year when it's Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. I know that you have been at this for 30 years, maybe 30 years plus now. What, what's been the most satisfying part of, of caring for patients with Parkinson's? Well, I, I think one thing that I realized was that with optimum treatment, people can do a lot better than one might think. If you read newspapers and magazines and watch TV, you think that everybody ends up like that unfortunate Muhammad Ali. He had a very unusual disorder. He should not be regarded as the prototype of typical Parkinson's disease. I see a lot of folks that I've followed not just for years, but now for you know 15 years, 20 years, and they're not necessarily doing fabulously, but you know they're still active and they're engaged in lives. And uh, it's not that they're getting around in wheelchairs. They have deficits, but you know in Olmsted County, Minnesota, they almost live out the normal uh, lifespan. Mm. Is and that it, right? In fact, the projections are the latest is that they live one year short of their actuarial projections. So well, that's is, impressive. What has happened in those thirty years, or however many years you want to put it, that the treatment has changed or the treatment has improved to um, improve the quality of life? Well, it's an interesting story. You know, levodopa. Levodopa is a precursor to dopamine. Dopamine is a brain neurotransmitter. Arvid Carlson won the Nobel Prize in the 1960s for recognizing that brain dopamine levels are low in Parkinsonism. He had animal models of that. He could deplete dopamine. Animals would look Parkinsonian. The recognition was if we replenish dopamine, we can reverse a lot of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So dopamine given by mouth or IV cannot get into the brain. But if you give the immediate precursor, that is a substance that is natural but one step removed, which is levodopa, the brain uh, receives that because it's transported into the brain and the brain manufactures dopamine out of that. That was a, a huge discovery and it was FDA approved in 69. That isn't quite the end of that story. A lot of people were nauseated, and it took a zillion milligrams of levodopa to do any good. So scientists, this is really a clever uh, recognition that scientists made. They recognized that levodopa, before it got into the brain, was being converted to dopamine. And there were two bad consequences of that. Number one, there's a blood-brain barrier, and dopamine cannot get into mm -hmm. the brain couldn't be transported. So it did take a zillion milligrams to get in there. But it's not entirely true it couldn't get into the brain, that is the dopamine. It crossed into the nausea and vomiting center where there is no blood-brain barrier. So everybody oh was gosh. nauseated and a lot of people were vomiting. So scientists designed another product called, in this country, Carbidopa in Europe, Bensericide, does one thing. Can't cross into the brain and it blocks the conversion of levodopa to dopamine by blocking one enzyme. So the standard of treatment for the past 40-some years has been carbidopa levodopa. The original brand name attached to that by the company Merck, Cinnamon. And so those of you that were in, in Catholic grade school recognize Cinna without emesis, without vomiting. Oh, and no, that's, that's where that's the, the name carbidopa. came from. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And so that's been the standard of treatment. Now, uh, what, what was recognized early on was that uh, a lot of patients became like brittle diabetics. You know, there are a lot of ups and downs and fluctuations. And, and you know, it really took, uh, I think, savvy clinicians a while to figure out that these things can be managed. And it does take a lot of investment in that. And in this, in this current era, savvy clinicians, I think, do the best managing Parkinson's disease with carbidopa levodopa alone. 
And we should mention to, the, to our audience that you, if you want the Bible on, uh, and you're a patient on the treatment of Parkinson's disease, it's Dr. Alscog's book, second edition. It's called The New Parkinson's Disease Treatment Book. Highly successful, I assume. And thank you, by the way, for sending me a copy. Yeah. Well, I don't know, to be honest with you, but it's, <laughs> down, it's downstairs in the mail store. And, uh, I it's bet on it's flying off the shelf. Huh? Yeah. 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 I haven't seen that as I walked by. But yeah, but actually everything that I, I know about Parkinson's disease, they tried to put in there and I tried to make it readable. So I hopefully it's a useful book for people. That was the intent. Terrific book. So when someone comes in and uh, we'll talk about how you make the diagnosis, but how do you explain the disease to the patient and their family? Well, I start off by talking about dopamine because that's a fundamental substrate for what is the visible evidence of Parkinson's disease. There are things that we know now occur in sort of a subtle way in not all people but years before, acting out your dreams. That's called REM sleep behavior disorder. People who are constipated in midlife have a greater risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Really? People who have been anxious uh, are at a greater risk of later developing Parkinson's disease. Sometimes loss of sense of smell is an early marker. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody who has been constipated or anxious gets Parkinson's disease, but it's now recognized that there is a significant increase in that risk if you have those problems. So those probably are early forerunners of Parkinson's disease, but they fly under everybody's radar screen. What really then becomes recognizable would be slowness of movement, shuffling gait, stoop posture, loss of animation, loss of arm swing, and then some non-motor symptoms too that actually still don't get recognized. Anxiety, common problem of Parkinson's disease even though it's not visible. Insomnia is another one. Uh, I mentioned uh, acting out your dreams. Well, uh, getting to sleep is a problem if you have Parkinson's disease as well too. And uh, so those are things that are so-called non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. But what really brings it into evidence would be shuffling gait and things like that. It tremor, is that tremor frequent? Well, it occurs in 80% of people, but in 20% you never see tremor. Is it that tremor or shuffling that help you diagnose a patient then, or how do you ultimately diagnose them? Well, you take all these symptoms and signs and you can put them together in any package. So some people shuffle, some people don't. Some people shuffle with one leg, you know, they have a stiff leg. Mm -hmm. uh, some people have facial masking, you know, loss of facial animation, some don't. There are occasional people I'll see where anxiety is in spades, panic attacks, and, uh, and yet the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease are fairly minimal. And if you look at what goes on in the brain with this dopamine loss, it isn't uniform. You know, the, you'd think something like this, it should be everywhere the same, but it's very patchy loss. So in one person, it's a little more here, a little less there, and the next person, it's an entirely different, uh, sort of a random pattern of that dopamine system. This is a clinical diagnosis. You don't have any help from a blood test or a brain scan, correct? Or It is a clinical diagnosis. So it, it's what people tell you and then what you see in the clinic. There are occasional people I see who are on treatment and doing well, and then I go by what they report pre-treatment because a lot of times that what I mentioned, the carbidopa levodopa, gets people almost to normal. I saw somebody yesterday who was normal. Wow. Incredible. Dopa, leave it open. So it's, it's probably uh, appropriate to say that you have made huge progress in the treatment of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease over the past 30 years. Well, well, we have, and I think it really gets down to uh, the discovery of levodopa, then the discovery of carbidopa in this country and benzeroside in Europe, so then that makes it tolerable. And then I think what's changed uh, has also been the recognition of how to treat it. There's sort of a side story here. You know, doctors were always looking for something better and better. So they started digressing, looking for other drugs. And, and I've been, you know, I'm 100% in the clinic all day, every day. And I've tried all these other drugs. <laughs> and they really come up short. And I realized some years ago, you've got to get the carbidopa levodopa dosing scheme right. And it's a little bit of a dynamic, too. It changes over time. You know, people are stable for a number of years, and then they become uh, 
uh, tied to each dose that they take. So they'll take a dose of carbidopa levodopa, then they're good for a few hours, and it wears off. So you have to match not only you have not only have to get the right dose, but you have to get the right dosing interval. And there's a lot of flexibility there. So I tell people, do not worry about the number of doses or tablets per day. Find the dose that works the best, and then you adjust the dose to match the response duration. And you, all of your experience, I'm sure, helps also. Neurologist Dr. Eric Alskog, and also author of the book, The New Parkinson's Disease Treatment Book. Time for a short break, but when we come back, we'll talk more about the treatment and why Awareness Month for Parkinson's disease is important. But when we come back, myth or matter of fact, people who have a high IQ are at an increased risk for Parkinson's disease. We'll find out. You're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is Dr. Eric Alskog. He's a neurologist and an expert on Parkinson's disease at the Mayo Clinic and also author of the book, The New Parkinson's Disease Treatment Book. And really, it's the Bible for mm-hmm. people with Parkinson's disease. All right, myth or matter of fact. I'm really interested in this one. (laughs) Myth or matter of fact, Dr. Alskog, people who have a high IQ are at an increased risk for Parkinson's disease. Is that a myth or a matter of fact? Well, I don't know about any data on IQ, and most of us don't get our IQs measured, so it would be hard to know. But it I'm is sure true. ours is high, though. Yeah. Well, well, measured or not. Huh? Don't put me in on this. You're <laughs> the one who said, it, where did you hear this? All right. Well, I did hear at one time that the, that the population that, w- that had the highest risk for Parkinson's disease was physicians. And, of course, I immediately assumed uh, that it was people with high IQ. You're no, correlating. And that might have been in there, too. But I, that's what brought the whole issue up. And, and I'm not sure. So I wanted to ask you, well, because let me doctors t- are at increased risk. Let they? me say this, myth or matter of fact, doctors are at an increased risk for Parkinson's. Well, that is true based upon Olmsted County patients who are followed here at the Mayo Clinic and Olmsted Medical Center. And so it's sort of a captive audience. You know, once you move to Rochester, Minnesota, you never want to leave. <laughs> I wanted to live in Florida when I grew up, and I've been here 38 years. So <laughs> that's, that's a different side story. Why you got hooked. Yeah, but point of fact, it is true that in Olmsted County, when, when the, the group here in epidemiology looked at professions that were associated with Parkinson's disease, physicians rose to the top. They're, that's the group that was the most likely to be uh, diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. So intuitively, you might say that, well, maybe it's just because they recognized it and made the diagnosis themselves. But there was another study done on something called incidental Lewy body disease. So it turns out that about 15 people out of 100 who are over the age of 60 and die without Parkinsonism, tremor, dementia, or any neurologic problems on post-mortem brain examination will have the microscopic marker of Parkinson's disease, which is Lewy bodies. And it turns out that uh, among those incidental Lewy body cases, there were about 36, I think, 30 some that in our cohort here. And it turned out that guess what profession rose to the top? Physicians again. So that wasn't a diagnostic kind of confounding factor. These were people that they knew they were physicians, but they didn't know they had Lewy bodies. So mm-hmm. your suspicion isn't so much that this is a bunch of smart people, like Dr. Shives would like to believe, <laughs> but that maybe uh, something of the lifestyle of physicians are what contributing contributes to that? Yeah, that's a $64 question. could be <laughs> exposures. We were talking earlier about maybe it's that some physicians never slept during the previous era. You know, now there are... There are Rules. Huh? Rules, rules and regulations. Yeah, now. there yeah. are. So there's Guidelines. some limitations. But I described how when I was a medical intern, you know, working 110-hour weeks for two months in a row was actually expected. Wow. Yeah, it was expected. And there, that's, that's one of the ways that you clear bad breakdown products, protein products, that are like alpha, uh, beta amyloid and Alzheimer's disease, alpha synuclein and Parkinson's disease. There is good scientific evidence that when you're asleep, the areas around the brain cells dilate and you kind of tend to flesh out those bad things that don't belong there. So oh, I, you're serious about this? That I'm maybe perfectly lack of serious. Sleep. Wow. I'm perfectly serious about that, yes. It was published in Science Magazine, which is, I mean, one of the most reputable scientific publications in the world. I mean, this, this is the how you, how you get rid of some of these bad products in your brain. Well, that uh, the interviews that we've done in the past that talk about you know the genetics piece and the telomeres on the ends of those gene codes 
that sleep is one of the things that helps to protect and restore that. So it would make sense that if you're going periods of time with very inadequate sleep, that it would end up doing some sort of cellular damage. Yeah, and apart from the telomeres, you know, the, the thought about what causes all of these midlife neurodegenerative disorders, from Alzheimer's disease to ALS to uh, various forms of dementia and Parkinson's disease, there's a protein, at least one, in Alzheimer's there's two, that seems to be the bad actor. And these are natural proteins that are in all brain cells, so beta amyloid and tau in Alzheimer's disease, alpha-synuclein in Parkinson's disease. These belong there. They have a purpose in the brain cells, but it seems that they dissociate from where they should be. They aggregate, and then they sort of gum up the work, so to speak. So you want to get rid of those. You know, there's a, there's a natural turnover of products everywhere in the body. You make them, and you dispose of them. And in the in terms of alpha-synuclein for Parkinson's disease, you probably want to get rid of all that bad alpha-synuclein that's now starting maybe to gum up the works. So during sleep, maybe that's one of the factors. These things, uh, these diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Al uh, Parkinson's disease, they're very complicated, however. Probably there are many factors that weigh into this, but I think that's one plausible component to that. One interesting thing about uh, uh, Parkinson's, I know that age is, is the biggest risk factor. The older you are, the more likely you are to get it. But there are, peop there are young people who get Parkinson's disease, right? What's the youngest person you've ever seen? Uh, 20s. The, if, you, if you get Parkinson's disease before age 40, then you have an increased risk of having a detectable gene. If it's before age 20, then it's very likely. There are three known genes called the Parkin gene, Parkin gene PINK1, and DJ1. So that's, that's the only population of patients where I would, I would measure a gene product to see if there's a genetic underpinning. For folks that get it at a normal age, the likelihood that you're going to detect something isn't very great. There's and what is that age? The normal age. What, what's the usual age? Well, it kind of peaks in 60s and 70s, and it kind of depends on, on how you look at it. Maybe it continues to go up. In Olmsted County, it looks like it continues to increase. But it's, it's rare, certainly rare before age 40. In Olmsted County, less than 1% of our incident population developed it before age 40, less than 1%. And then as you continue, increase the age, and it becomes more and more likely. All right, it's Parkinson's Disease Awareness Month. Why is that a good thing for you and for the population in general? Well, I think funding for research would certainly be one important aspect of this. You know, it's, it, these neurodegenerative conditions, they're, they're affecting more and more of the population because we're, we're getting older, and stuff happens when you get older. And for just like Alzheimer's disease, which has gotten a lot of press, we don't have any ways of curing this. Fortunately, in Parkinson's disease, we have pretty good but not perfect symptomatic treatment, but that's not fabulous forever. So we need to figure out how to get at the cause of this, and that takes a lot of research and some time and, and money to fund it. Thanks so much for sharing your expertise with us. Parkinson's expert, Dr. J. Eric Alskog, author of the book, The New Parkinson's Disease Treatment Book. It is the Bible. Thanks again, Dr. Alskog. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.